Hey everyone, before we begin, I just wanted to briefly mention that we recorded this episode in early March before kind of the coronavirus situation had escalated to the point that it has today. Um, and this is end of March now. Um, this is before the quarantines and the lockdowns in Europe had set in, had been put in place, I think maybe like three or four days before that. Um, I'm currently locked. Uh, I'm currently outside of my home in uh, in France. So I've I came to France to get quarantined, basically, with my significant other because I could tell that um, things were going like borders were going to get shut and we were going to get stuck be- without each other for the next who knows you know month or two. And we figured if we both are working remotely, then we'd rather be together and um, you know just rather than being alone um i mean it's a (laughs) i'm glad i did it because uh now i'm with someone rather than being alone but um it's tough you know i'm away from all my equipment i'm away from my uh, podcasting setup um just working off a laptop and with using team viewer um but i know that's also not the biggest issue considering the fact that i still have a job which is good and (laughs) then some of my friends don't um so this is a it's not an easy time we hope that this is uh an interesting episode for you guys to listen to as it's kind of a special episode for us it's episode 100 and uh we had all three kind of founders of the podcast back together to talk about um kind of the last four years of vr and ar as well as the podcast um we hope it's a good distraction from kind of the stuff that's going on in the world right now and um i think that's that's the sort of things i've been looking out for is to not find discussions about coronavirus but more about the things that i'm just into and uh we hope this serves as that and uh i hope to also make more podcasts while i'm here um we'll just have to be more creative about uh the audio situation um yeah all right uh enjoy the podcast i think it's pretty interesting if you especially if you've listened to the podcast for the last couple of years um we we talk about a lot of things all right bye hello everyone and welcome back to the research vr podcast the podcast behind the science and design of virtual reality i am your host azad balabanian and with me today are two special guests for a very special episode episode number 100 yeah <laughs> and of course the two special guests are the original co-hosts of the research vr podcast christoph well you you still need some training Kshistov. Uh, <laughs> um, that's I'm, close. Kshistov. Uh, ah, that's nice. There we go. Kshistov Izdebski and Pet Lekov. Us three kind of started this podcast back mm-hmm. in 2016 at the dawn of virtual reality and augmented reality. In fact, I think just a month before uh, everything launched. And, uh, and I guess also now a month, uh, a month has just passed from our fourth birthday, our fourth Yay. anniversary, which is uh, really cool. I feel like, old now. Yeah, right. <laughs> like I I mean 4 years ago, you know, if you after after we had our first initial Skype conversation when we had mm-hmm. met through Twitter, you know, and, and it was some one of us had said like, you know, I wonder if we're going to be having these like the sort of conversations, <laughs> you know, 4 years later, I I I don't think I would have like thought that was very likely. So that is uh that's pretty fascinating. I guess we are one of the few like there's been quite a lot of VR podcasts that also have come out since then. Uh mm. some that have died, some of some yeah. that have like stayed, but I guess we have still stayed around, you know. <laughs> which is, uh, yeah, yeah, good job guys. Yeah, thank that's you. All thanks to you. Well, and uh, the great audience, obviously. Yeah, no, yes. I mean the 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 listeners I think have been fantastic. Uh yes. I don't know how people find the podcast, but I'm always surprised when like I run into people at especially at like VR conferences or yeah, at VR conferences or like VR events. It's typically developers that know about the podcast and uh that always makes me really happy because that's like th- that was the original idea, right? Like when we mm-hmm. when uh, let's give that little context again how this started it was um 
Peter, I think you found me or I found you through Twitter. Yeah, we had both in our Twitter bio, cognitive science. Cognitive, or something yeah, like cognitive science and VR. And we both yeah. were like, whoa, that's whoa, cool. Whoa, that's a match. <laughs> like on Tinder. <laughs> like on Tinder. And then I remember asking you about if you're interested in like UI, UX, which is like what I was really uh, focusing on. And you're like, no, but one of my colleagues does. Mm-hmm. Uh, stuff like let's all have a, a call together and uh i think i even have a screenshot by the way of the skype conversation Ooh. um yeah I, I i i was recently looking through the screenshots on my on my uh, laptop and <laughs> i was like whoa i think that's my i don't know why i took that screen screenshot but it's there you knew you that failed. it's going to be important in the future yeah and yeah, so the failed. next step is to print it put it in a golden frame <laughs> put it like a diploma on your on your wall <laughs> yeah, none of us are smiling. We're all just like very serious yeah. faces. Like, mm. let's do business. Yeah. yeah. So, Kishtof, I guess we haven't heard of heard from you in a while. Uh, last time we heard from you, you were working on. Uh, you were at grad school doing your PhD, correct? That is correct. Those were good days. Those were good days. <laughs> those, uh, those days are uh, gone. Right. Uh, so, so what happened? So what happened is I discovered how cool it is to be a product manager of your own product mm. and that it's actually much cooler than doing a PhD and it brings <laughs> me much closer to much faster to my goal. So as people in academia like to say you 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 went into industry. Yeah, basically, basically. I mean, the hope was I can marry these two things uh, together, right. but that didn't pan out well. Uh, mm. management takes a lot of time and uh, doesn't really align well with the scientific thinking. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, I mm. completely switched from doing a PhD. Maybe one day I will come back to it, but for now, completely focusing on uh, this tool that you can use for uh, evaluating your assembly processes and your ergonomics at your assembly station. Like hmm. when you assemble a car, you need to calculate how much time it takes to do a specific part of the process and how healthy it is to assemble it. So g- give us, give some context, um, I guess, kind mm-hmm. of where, where like, what, well, first of all, what was the PhD in? Ah, sure. um, and yeah, kind of how long, how long did you go yeah. uh, before you decided to leave? Yeah, I was actually thinking how it all started, and I think not. I my one of my first thoughts when I saw modern virtual reality was that you could use it for collecting a lot more data than you can uh, in the real world, and therefore you could build some awesome user experience evaluation tool. Obviously, four years ago it wasn't as well framed as well uh, right now. But the thought was always there. Uh, And then as part of my PhD, I was uh, looking into how to use virtual reality for evaluation of user experience. I was hoping to make some generalized method uh, from the beginning. But a bit through my own research and a bit through the context in which I was working, so I was always doing this PhD with salt and pepper, so where I work now. Uh, we discovered that the ergonomics and process evaluation is perfect for this because there is a huge need for new tools uh, for evaluating in this space. And there is actually a lot already standardized. A lot of what you actually would like to measure is pretty clear. And only a technological jump has to be made collect these data just to clarify like so you were using vr as an evaluation tool for 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 like products that aren't vr related right like correct you, correct you're, so, you're using it as a behavioral tracking kind of platform basically yes yes so you have your um, assembly line let's say you assemble an suv and in this suv you need to put an engine inside with some sort of tool with some sort of crane because it's heavy, then you have to screw it. You have to pick up different parts from the shelves around the line. Uh, And during that, you need to bend, you need to crouch, you need to uh, reach something above your head. Um, And in production planning and assembly planning, 
you also have to evaluate it. So you have to calculate how many steps do you do in your production planning? How long does this uh, cycle take? How many times do you reach up of your hand? Because reaching up of the shoulder is generally unhealthy if you do it right. all day. So, well, I mean, what about, so it sounds like the, the research you were doing was relevant for your work. Yes. Um, like, why did you like then decide to cut the research short and just go straight into working full time? Well, to be honest, it it isn't completely cut short. It's just that I personally don't do it. So we work with the University of Osnabrück, with uh, Fraunhofer Institute, uh, with uh, Hochschule, uh, with University of Applied Sciences from Koblenz, many different experts that are much bigger experts already in the field of ergonomics or eye tracking than me. And uh, they invest their time into the science behind this. They do the scientific studies. They do the uh, scientific quality of evaluation. While at the same time, I can focus on the needs of customers and how to convert the science once it's done into a feature hmm. that can be actively used. Nice. Let's let's get back to this. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> and uh, pets, where uh, where are you these days um, compared to the last time we checked in with you, which was actually quite a bit ago. Uh, we haven't been recording too many episodes uh, in the last like six months. That's true. Um, the last six months were quite an interesting ride and currently I'm actually on a path of being, uh, in a sense, a freelancer, doing um, most of the things I've been doing throughout the years, so communication and project management, um, but also like evangelizing and, and partner management of different exhibitions, but more as an independent person and behind the scenes uh, doing a little bit uh, of exploratory for different products or different ideas, what can be done. And uh, in fact, I think uh, this is the first time I actually announced officially somewhere. Uh, I'm not a longer part of Salt and Pepper, which I used to be, as you might remember from different podcasts. And I just thought, um, you know, science was amazing back then. Then the corporate slash business lifestyle was also great to learn. But I figured out that, um, I mean, when, when you look at it, landscape you know germany and europe and, and you basically see how different stakeholders play together especially when it comes to innovation and uh, you know moving the boundaries forward i have a feeling it's going a little bit slower than it could be and i decided that if i'm uh, going to be independent uh, i can pretty much do a little bit broader uh, scopes of topics and the different uh, points of interest that i have huh. yeah so now that we updated uh, on Chris and me, what's with you as? How have, you know, the last four years have been for you and what has changed? Where are you right now? Last four, four years, actually. Um, I am in Germany now. How funny Ooh. is that? Like, I also... Now we are been, all together in one country. That's right. Yes. All, four, all, all three of us immigrants in Germany. Yes. Living. <laughs> yeah. Um, Paying taxes. Paying taxes, <laughs> being good citizens, uh, enjoying uh, universal health care, which yes. I did not have in America. That was that's nice. <laughs> um, let's see. I yeah, I mean, I'm in Germany for the last year. I, in fact, I or last week was like my one year anniversary here. God, everything is an anniversary today. <laughs> um, I'm working at Realities IO, and I'm uh, in charge of doing all things photogrammetry. So from the capture to the processing to the engine side implementation, and now I'm doing a lot of also mesh retopology and texture fixing. I, it, it is really nice. I, I have to say like four years ago, when we first started talking, I might've even had tried photogrammetry at that point because I tried it first in the lab as a mm -hmm. as an idea that I had. And I knew there was something really interesting there, but didn't know to what extent you know, this would be important in my life. Um, and over the last couple of years, I, um, yeah, I met the two co-founders of Realities IO, David and Daniel, and uh, a year and a half or two, or two years after that, the now, you know, I moved to Germany to work with them. Um, so that's been really, it's been kind of a, quite a blessing. Like, uh, there's not that many places where, you know, you I could work on photogrammetry specifically for VR. So, very thankful on uh, on that part. You remember when we had some first time on a podcast? Yeah, fifteenth <laughs> February two thousand seventeen. 
Oh, did, do you know that or did you look that uh, up? I looked it up. VR okay. promotion is <laughs> Daniel's Pro with Realities IO. Nice. Uh, Daniel actually studied at the same university as uh, Chris and me have been. Mm-hmm. That's right. And he was he's also a cognitive scientist. Yes. Um, so that was uh, my initial kind of like connection with them was me nerding out with Daniel about CogSci and VR. Mm-hmm. And yeah, him telling, he, him telling me about how he like really worked on this blink teleport locomotion system which was i think that was that must have been one of the first times that someone had experimented with like teleport not just being a a, you know a straight teleport but like Mm -hmm. to zoom to really like fast forward fly towards the teleporting location Mm -hmm. uh, in a way to kind of like still retain cognitive uh understanding of the scene rather than getting disoriented so that was that was interesting, and then I had, and then I spoke with David, who was like kind of all, all in charge of photogrammetry, and he's probably one, like one of the pioneers behind using photogrammetry in VR. I remember being so excited to meet someone else that knew anything about photogrammetry, and I was like, you know, like what software do you use? How do you do this? How do you do that? And he's like, ah, look at one of these noobs like talking to me <laughs> about photogrammetry again. But eventually, like we spoke. I don't know how when we spoke after that, but when I told them um, in 2017 that I was going on a trip to like Armenia and uh, a few places around Europe that I wanted to do some scanning with my drone, he was like, Ooh, like that sounds like that would be something interesting for our app um, on steam realities. Uh, Maybe I should come with you to Armenia. So I spent like a week and a half with him there and and, uh, learned a lot actually. Um, And that was kind of the basis for us working together in the future. And now working here so that's been nice i guess um yeah we can in this episode like we'll let's let's talk a little bit about uh yeah last four years like Mm -hmm. (laughs) where we're where were we when we first started this uh things that happened along the way um and then we'll also go into like vr itself vr and ar um kind of where what has happened over the last four years so the context around how the podcast even started was I was so my main goal in my, in my senior year of college, uh, my bachelor was like, I want to have a job offer by the time I graduate. That was like, so like a goal, a target for me, uh, because like I knew a lot of people that were struggling to find jobs and I was like terrified to just like finish and then just move home and then be like, okay, what do I do now? Um, so I wanted to like at least have something and it was a really grueling, like nine or 10 months, I'd say, um, of just like trying, applying, trying, applying. Like, uh, I, I, I'm really, I'm also again, extremely fortunate that I, um, I met like my professor, uh, professor Nicholas Davidenko at UC Santa Cruz. I took a class uh, on perception that he, he taught that was that's kind of his forte and he mentioned at the end of his of the class that like they or uh, he runs a vr lab or at least they have a lab where they use vr for cogsci and i was like that is freaking amazing like i i need to like i, I knew about vr i had tried vr a bunch of times uh i didn't i wasn't like this is exactly what I want to be doing. Like that was just, it was just interesting to me. But um, the thing that really sold me on everything was the whole perception class was about like, or most of it was, was visual perception, some auditory perception, like spatial perception. Um, And it was like, you know, this is interesting. Like uh, it's interesting to know how your eyes work and all. And, but like, why is this relevant? And then it all wrapped to get, it all came together at the end when he was like, all of these things are really relevant um, if you're going to be using like virtual reality because it's like a very brain focused technology and you need to know all these systems to like understand it. And I was like, Oh, like that's cool. Like I need to get into this lab. And I spent that summer, this is the summer before my senior year to, to get into his lab because it was super, uh, it was like high demand. So I spent all summer actually in Santa Cruz in my, in the college town, um, volunteering at his lab. And just, I, I was kind of a, just, a, a a data processing monkey, basically, uh, just putting features on faces because they're one of the grad students was like doing like facial perception research that led me to being a research assistant in the lab for the rest of the year. And like also gave me access to a DK two, which was incredible. Cause then like I was able to download Oculus share apps, you know, you guys remember that Oculus share, that was 
the website to download yeah. things. Yeah, I remember like three different. Yeah, Oculus Share was like the main sort of official place where you could get all the apps, but you had to be very careful because if you had the wrong runtime, you couldn't run it anymore. Right. That was that happened like towards uh, the, right before launch. I remember they went into like. 0.6 or 0.7 runtime, yeah. which mm-hmm. actually was not backwards compatible, and that yeah, killed yeah, yeah. all the software. Oh, no, it was a quite a lot of fun. We were actually developing the experiment back then, and it was always <laughs> a pain in the ass to update the runtime. SDK runtime and all mm. the stuff in Unity. I actually recently uh, had like a tiny hackathon with a friend, and we played around a little bit with the quest. And I was like surprised. There's still like some why from that old SDK. In the stuff that you have those days, yeah. but the doku and everything is just so way more complex. Yeah, mm-hmm. there there is a lot of like these little SDKs they they made in like 2015, 2016, like this like this lip syncing SDK and yeah. like the stuff that that is definitely legacy stuff that has that hasn't really maybe hasn't even been used as far as I know. Um, but uh, that yeah, that was kind of my my introduction into this field and and like meeting you guys and talking about this. I was like, okay, like. I'd been listening to podcasts since like 2007 or maybe Ooh. 2008, like pretty early on. And in fact, I used to be super embarrassed about it because like who, who listened to, who listens to podcasts? Like fucking nerds, right? Like nobody listened, like, at least back then, like nobody listened to podcasts, like people in your ears talking for an hour. And it, the, the, like it did come out of like social isolation. Like that was to me. Um, like I didn't have that many friends when I had first moved to the U S uh, it was like, I realized that in this, if you live in the suburbs, like there isn't that much to do, you know, there aren't kids you just go outside and play with. So to me, like podcasts very much like occupied that space in my, in my ears. And so I always knew I'd love to like, maybe at least participate on a podcast. Um, never knew that I would like, will actually be able to, to have one and host one and, and run one. Um, and then when we had our first like conversation, I think it was pretty clear to all of us that I was like, okay, there's, there's something interesting here that at least the topics that we're covered, that, that we talked about, like, and in fact, if you listen to the first like five or 10 episodes, it's like much more science focused where we took a, a subject like locomotion or, or VR sickness. And then we, it was like an auditory lecture, an auditory like breakdown of, of the mean- subject. We were at a university and we were students. So that was pretty <laughs> yeah. much the format we were experiencing every day. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it was, it, I mean, it's a, it was a good idea. It still is a good idea. It just took so much work yes. and, and we knew it oh, wasn't yeah. gonna like, it, we knew, you know, by like episode six or something that that format was just super like time consuming and, um, and it might not, not even have been the best way to like, you know, for people to, uh, absorb that information. Um, some things it's, you know, you need some, uh, visual format for it as well. Um, but I guess we, we realized that like, you know, okay, there's, there's other things we can also do. Um, at some point we we even started kind of covering more of the news. Peter, I think that I remember, mm-hmm. I remember doing that when we were live streaming a little bit. Yep. Um, I don't know when we did our first interview like that would must have been pretty early like early on around um, around episode 10 to 12 because uh, yeah. sometime in the beginning we did uh, cognitive xr yeah we have like episode. fishbowl at episode 12 hmm, fishbowl nice. vr with fishbowl. jeffrey sco r.i.p man not not to jeffrey sco but the company um huh? they they should yeah they shut down a little while ago who um fishbowl f- yeah. fishbowl there oh, yeah. are i was just checking how it's going user testing um yeah. app I think it was too early yeah i mean yeah it just it it costs money to do this stuff and a lot of vr companies don't have like extra cash to just you know spend on users uh being testers for their apps you know for for analytics like in fact nowadays people just use their own discord channels to give like you know early access to some of their users and have them test it out for free but um <laughs> but yeah I guess, honestly now from the position of the manager of the project i would also not consider using the service i was much would much more prefer do an open beta or give a beta of my software directly to the customer and hear the feedback directly from the active user 
than mm. uh, pumping it through an external service. Yeah. But it was a neat idea, but it probably just Yeah, I mean, eventually that stick. will be the way to, to, to do things. But we are not uh, yet where the websites are or I'm where the mobile skeptical. apps are. I'm skeptical if this is going to be the way. I think it will be way more automatized. Yeah. But who knows? I, I, I don't know. I, I think there's so much you can gain from like having a, commu a community of users that, you know, are, are yes. their incentive is to like, they're not, you know, incentivized by money, but as much as like they're incentivized by like the mission of the project itself or the product and like to them having early access to something is is a huge incentive. Yeah, but that's already different than than what uh, Fishbowl VR was uh, providing. Fishbowl mm. VR was not really providing the software to early users, early your early version of the target group. It was just providing to VR experts who would test your application, test it against heuristics or test it against their own experience with virtual reality as such. Uh, and not really the people who would be using your application. Hmm. So unless you assume VR experts are the target group of your application, then I see. So not entirely sure how much this would provide. It's more for like new users, completely new users, rather than um, or like different, like not yeah, yeah not expert so users. If you look at usertesting.com or similar websites. Um, there you have both, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, there you have both experts in user experience and also people who are generally interested in this specific type of application. You can choose which applications you're testing. So you wouldn't test some complicated Excel table if that's not your gem. And so I still think that something like... Uh, Usertesting.com for virtual reality is an is a neat idea and it should exist, but there should be first enough users who would be who would like to test it, so that you actually test your cohorts or so you actually test. For sure, I mean, there's obviously like a lot to gain from understanding how to, you know, non-expert users, you know, perceive what you're building. Um, but in the early stages of a product, let's say, which is what every VR company was, you do need to, um, rather than try to shoot, you know, broad, you kind of really need to narrow down a scope of who your users are to at least gain that initial traction with some set of users. Well, you know? technically, you still need to do it now. I'm no, no, yeah, for sure. sure. If we moved on from that. Definitely not. I mean, you kind of still need to know how to build you know what who are your first hundred users like that, sure, that it's yeah. hard your those hundred users are end up they're most likely going to end up you know maybe being similar to each other in terms of like their technical ability or like what uh, you know the reasons why they want to use something um rather than like you know okay i'm just building a uh, a productivity app like how does any random user off the street you know mm -hmm. feel about it um, mm, i mean in, in theory you have things like uh, i mean at least for websites and uh, app design like disability score or like uh, well, maybe not disability score but the score how how easy the application is you know uh, user friendly the color uh, coding is maybe good for colorblind people and i mean if you look at a you know average like if you look at a typical VR app, right? I mean, either it's a game and you can probably just add Unity Analytics or some other things and just see how what people are doing in field, distributing it through the Discord, as you other said. Uh, if you're building something more specific, I think it's very, very narrow focus. So, I mean, you're not building really right now, at least the next Microsoft Office. You know, in VR, you're rather building something for medically impaired people or for firefighters or, or for one specific group. And I guess you just don't get that type of specific groups through any website testing, right? It's just, yeah, not a broad, you don't need to particularly need to test on like a huge broad set of people, but more for, I guess you want to see if you're reaching the audience that you really do want to reach. Um, but I mean, I'm looking at the list of, of pot of episodes around then it's like, 
<laughs> there's definitely a lot of mer- memories that are coming up um <laughs> there like the how vr affects memories and dreams was an it was a particular favorite of mine because that was like a topic that i kept seeing on twitter coming up a lot and um i wanted to like focus on it and see you know what are the interesting uh takeaways i don't know if man i don't even know if i agree with most of this stuff <laughs> like conclusions that i reached like i think probably the biggest thing that i i like you know disagree with myself in the past is like all having to do with like locomotion and in fact i don't even agree with myself in like the last like six months or three months like i i think that's i keep going back and forth on like what it is like how you should be moving in vr um but one thing is for sure it's that there are a ton of use there are a ton of users that do want to have what they call like artificial locomotion you know stick locomotion um you, like a, like a traditional video game and that's been really driven home by uh like onward and pavlov like these two shooting games which um people want to be able to move similarly to how they have in like counter strike and um that but kind the, of but the yeah. question is why so what they really need is the agility agility that you need in these games. In the games like the uh, Counter-Strike, in this case Onward, for example, you actually need this continuous movement because teleporting or even dashing completely breaks how you would expect uh, a shooting game to work, a competitive shooting game to work. Yeah. And so you would need to build a teleport around this need. Or teleport, locomotion method. Yeah, but at some... the same time, add the motion sickness uh, element to it. Uh, I mean, some games have done it well. Like like Rec yeah, Room, I think, exactly. launched only with teleport. And in fact, that's still like a... Um, but you can select in uh, Rec Room, uh, like this yeah. uh, control with uh, controller, with a joystick. And I actually prefer in Rec Room just to sit in a chair don't move so much around and completely move uh, with a joystick, whether in Serenity or like more, you know, action intense games. They, of course, really like to jump through the room. I mean, the question is, what do you do? Like when you, you know, do stuff similar to as you others have been showing on YouTube like a few years ago with Medium, right? Clearing uh, complex objects that you scanned. That you clearly are not going to move really in the place for eight hours. You kind of want to lean back. And when you play like game for fitness reasons, like Tai Chi that I actually play today in the morning just to relax or, you know, some serenity stuff or whatever is on the quest is really engaged. You kind of want to move. So I guess it also depends on, you know, the scenarios that you want to play in, right? I mean, similar with a switch, you kind of want to be on the go, but you also want to connect it to a big TV when you're home. Yeah, but isn't the advantage of virtual reality really the uh, spatial understanding that you get from it? And you get a spatial understanding only if you use your body? No, well, no. I mean, it's, you still get the spatial understanding of a map by moving through it, you know, on a, on a 2D sure. monitor, which is, I think that's why people like artificial locomotion is that you have not stepwise motion, but you have just smooth mm. motion okay. through a scene. And that I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't have any research to back this up, you know, off the top of my head, but like, I do think that is the, like how, like that, that fundamentally creates a better understanding of, of the space is smoothly moving through it. Um, so, I mean, th- for those reasons, like that, that's a big one. I, I do, th- I think, th- I do think we should talk about, um, how room scale VR kind of like the, the, the benefit of it, I think is, it's, it's funny. Like, uh, let me quickly kind of build this argument. Like room scale. Okay. Let's go back to 2016. Oculus Rift and HTC Vive are, are neck and neck, you know, HTC Vive comes out or announces itself <laughs> itself in, tw- in like December of 2015. Mm-hmm. And it's supposed to be, you know, uh, it's supposed to have like a portal game with it that apparently HTC kind of like totally like announced or like they, they had some promotional material with, with the, the portal character and that Valve wasn't happy about. But anyway, the, the whole thing is that like HTC came out of nowhere with the Vive and it was supposed to be a better version of the Rift because of uh, the much wider tracking system with lighthouses. Mm-hmm. And the 
the whole thing is like, you know, like first there was just three DOF uh, headset, then there were six DOF with one camera, and then Oculus Rift like announces that they're going to have two cameras to have like this nice, you know, full <laughs> body movement. And like uh-huh. we're doing full room scale where you can just move around. Like, and if you look at the first trailer from HTC Vive, like it's all about like, having a whole entire living room for the kids to be able to like run around like the fantastic contraption game where you really like walk in your walk around the room and put things um and the lab was all about like room scale the the point i'm trying to make is like that whole concept of room scale it, not that it i think rather than it being super important to be able to walk around the room what it ended up being really good for is like to be able to be in everywhere in your room and still do and still be able to have vr so like if you're playing a couch a couch vr game or like if you're playing tilt brush um that you know you can scale the world and you don't have to actually walk around you can just sit on your couch and keep doing what you're doing or you can sit on the chair across the room and keep doing what you're doing rather than like have to be aware of where your um you know rift sensors were i think that that to me like that took a while for f- to really understand that like okay room scale doesn't actually have to mean you have to be running around in your room for a vr game to be fun but it just gives you the opportunity um to have your headset work anywhere within this room yes um i think you see also a interesting design difference um, from the user perspective still to those days between let's say the quest and like a vive it's way easier to recenter when you have like an Oculus or the Quest on. It's, it's kind of just always built in in the system. No, no matter where you're in the room, it's, it's, it's kind of you don't have to install any third party add ons or whatever. You just basically reset and it kind of always feels great. Last time I played around a little bit with a Vive system, I was like having uh, issues where I moved through the room and I couldn't like really get the tracking be exactly the same in game compared to reality. And another point, um, what at, at least that's my uh, observation. Most of stuff on Quest kind of encourages you to move. Like, of course, you have Tilt Brush and a few apps like Netflix where you probably want to run around. But from the game side, I, I don't think there is any game that is that easily played uh, in, you know, in couch potato mode. I mean, may, maybe Rec Room when, when you activate it. But it, I think um, yeah, there, there is also... Yeah. It is also this magic about being, I mean, of course, tethered versus untethered. I mean, it's a long debate, but I just observed myself being way more often in the quest, just doing Beat Saber or some sport workout with a pistol whip or whatever, and just enjoying this moving around and don't have the cable while actually the games emphasize you to move around the place. I mean, move around is like within within one like step dodge. of where you're yeah, standing. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like Which dodging. is what the Rift also could have done. Like that was the whole point is like, stand up and slightly like lean around like that was that was they thought like most games should just focus on that being the the distance uh, that you need to go and and uh, hsc and valve would like no no like you need to like always have room scale i mean even to you know a large extent my company like realities io that was they're like all trying to create different photogrammetry experiences where you really do take advantage of, of mm-hmm. movement and I, honestly it is it it does work really well when you have the space it, it for sure like look at the space yes. pirate trainer arena version i don't mm. know if you've seen this like two player mode where they have like a warehouse and it's two quests and you basically yeah you have you have tetherless you know headsets obviously and you're running around one room um and you're you're shooting at each other and like when you have a space that's for sure awesome but like most people don't and that's not you shouldn't really expect that for a game to to take off with when you have such huge like room requirements. So uh, defi- define room scale. What do you mean by room scale? Because I see uh, three topics that we discuss right now. One is tethered versus untethered. I don't think that's part of the room scale um, topic. But then the second one is the amount of space that you have and the sheer fact that you can actually fully move that you can use your whole body. So even in Beat Saber, you technically stand in one place, but you can move a lot. So yeah, what do you yeah. mean by room scale? Is it just no, the fact that you can move or that you have no, enough no, no. space? No, no, no. I'm making a point specifically about 
the 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 marketing as, aspect, the selling point of the Vive was that, or the the whole lighthouse system is that room scale is how games should be built around. And four years later, we're realizing that like, no, room scale is is fucking awesome to have, but not for the <laughs> sake of having your game be huge where you have to run around yeah, your room, yeah. but for the sake for the for the benefit that your headset and your controllers work anywhere within the room. Yes. And you don't really have to worry about like where in a, like you remember like even your orientation with the rift exactly uh mattered. Like, oh fuck, I have to always know like where your my computer is. It actually changed the way how uh, you know how games were uh, designed around it. So when you remember the first version of Robo Rico I don't, I don't, I haven't mm-hmm. tried it on the Quest, oh, yeah, but it had like, thing, yeah, yeah. You, I mean, it was the first game I encountered in VR where you would basically be able to teleport yourself, but while you teleport, you could shift around with a joystick and choose the orientation you would face when you're teleporting there. Yeah. And it was because of the limitation of the original Rift with the two, with the two camera systems that most people had. Um, I think I haven't noticed that much of that orientation teleportation thingy in you know those uh, modern yeah, modern games mm. yeah four years ago uh, in those you know rather new games. So I, I think it's still kind of exciting to turn yourself uh, in a room, and it's kind of also exciting. I mean, with a counting plus, or you know, you know, with those games where you explore a story. To kind of walk around or even with the Anne Frank Museum, it's kind yeah. of cool to have like two, three meters, X two, three meters. Yeah. But most of the time, you're kind of just dodging and shooting. Yeah. It, when you have room scale, it is, I mean, it for sure, when when it does work, it it is very nice. But it's just the minimal, like, um, what do you call it? Like the lowest common denominator between all VR users. It's like clearly not you're not the, the lowest common denominator is not going to be space you know like most yeah, people do not have that space but it's also not like completely sitting down and only looking in one direction right i mean gear vr yeah. and those headsets didn't i mean i st- still enjoyed the oculus go but uh, i actually miss those games but i guess i would never get it granted you know, th- these things do change with with quest i think that yeah. all, all of these all of this has been specifically about pc vr because most people's like PCs are in their bedrooms. Well, yes. technically with the Quest, you have a very different conversation about the room scale. Yeah. Uh, because you can literally use it from anywhere. Yeah. Even the train. I think Pat could upload some photos uh, to the yeah, Instagram. Yeah, I was playing Beat Saber on a running <laughs> train. It was fun. Yeah, it actually works. Very surprising yeah, nice. to uh, everyone that was watching. Yeah. Nice. Um, uh, but yeah, I basically, sh- basically, I agree with the argument that the big change is that you don't have to think about the technology because you can use it anywhere. Yeah. Um, your point about t- tethered versus tetherless, I think there isn't really like a point to argue. I guess maybe there is some some things to discuss there, but like tetherless is almost always you know better or like it's an advancement over tethered and. And if there's anything in there, if there's any scenarios where tethered is better, and that's only due to like the technology of wireless yeah. or tetherless just not Correct. being there. Um, yes. The coolest, honestly, the coolest advancement that I can point to in the last four years for VR ha- is the fact that Quest, like the Quest exists. First of all, do you remember how mm. um, how much of a holy grail it was to have inside out tracking yes. and uh, still for is. that it still is right? It's yeah. pretty, pretty crazy. But like I remember in 2016, that was all like we I'm sure it was we talked about t- like inside out tracking on an all in one headset like like over almost every episode and that being like that's what we need to get to and then yeah after you know two billion dollars and oculus uh-huh. being acquired and and facebook you know employing some of the best like computer vision yes. uh people they have like one of the most rock solid all in one yes. uh, inside out uh-huh. headset but so the point i'm 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 actually making is the the coolest advancement is not even that but the but it's the fact that now with the quest you have a all-in-one headset which you can use anywhere but also yes you can stream you can stream it from your pc your pc can act as a pc vr uh, device yeah. and then stream video to your quest so you have both a steam vr headset and an all-in-one wireless headset and it's like this hybrid system so when you're at home you could use it as a pc vr you have all the processing power of a, of a computer and then when you want it to be mobile um you it could be you know it, it's Except a it's Android phone. 
I mean, it doesn't no, have to be. It doesn't, doesn't have to be. be. Oh, Dude, I yeah. bought a Quest specifically because of ALVR, which is this like random app that was built. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was a way of like basically emulating a Steam, a, like a Steam VR headset to mm-hmm. a Go. It was built for, I think, Gear VR or Oculus Go so for 3 DOF basically. Yeah. I think it's also open source, right? It is open source. And then the Live VR people actually kind of built uh built a quest version they showed me like this early version yeah. where they're like dude you can stream steam vr uh content to a quest and i was like this this is blowing my mind like <laughs> I've, I've realized there was obviously latency and in, in the streaming quality but for certain apps where the you, fast movements don't matter like let's say like creative apps like tilt brush yeah. gravity sketch and even some games like vox machine which is like one of my favorite mech game mm-hmm. um it's the latency didn't really matter so that like that that was why i bought the quest like i knew it was obviously a technologically awesome thing but like i don't really play very many games but when i saw that you can stream i was like okay maybe i'll just use it as a virtual desktop from my bedroom to check in on like my photogrammetry scans on my pc and control my pc without actually being there and then oculus dude i don't think even oculus thought of this use case like they didn't even consider this use case until after quest launched and then they saw how many people were using it. They saw virtual desktop making yeah, exactly. uh, mm-hmm. a version, mm-hmm. a client for it and launching it through SideQuest. Um, that's a whole story. I think Upload actually did a, a an Upload VR did a small, short interview about that. I, I mean, there is an issue with this wireless thing, which is the user, right? I mean, uh, I <laughs> guess if Oculus could, you know, do some seamless magic 25G streaming out of the box, cheap, reliable, and every user would be able to use it, they would, you know, might have done it even, but it's just, I mean, you're technically at worst, me too, and Chris too, and we could probably can figure out the right drivers, the right Wi-Fi router with the right 5 gigahertz high pass, uh, best run. But, but even with the, you know, Oculus Link, um, the Quest Link, when you connect it to a PC, it had some driver issues and it should be more reliable than going wireless, right? Uh, so, I mean, I think for professional users or someone who is like really deep in VR, it's amazing. But I wouldn't necessarily call it like a huge setting point for new users. I don't know why I just feel that they might be disappointed by, you know, latency or just the chunk- chunkiness of it. It's, yeah, it's, I mean, it, I guess it requires some technical prowess yeah. from the user. It's not like, yeah, you yeah can but let's not forget people, that actually uh, we do have two target groups for virtual reality. We have one target group that brings the volume right now, that brings, a lot of people who are buying, buying the headset right now for the immediate entertainment or immediate benefit. Those are the users. Those are the uh, users that will not play around with the cable, that will not try to fix the drivers. Those are the users that are playing Beat Saber and Robo Recall and whichever game they can just buy and use. This is like the primary target group that we want to address with virtual reality because that's the scale. However, there are always new features, always new uh, paths that we would like to explore. Hmm. I, these new paths will be explored by the people who are ready to play uh, around with drivers. I disagree, by the way. Yeah, I, I, do, I don't think most of the users are not willing to look into like what exactly. cable to get like i in fact that's the benefit of being this early like all the early users in vr are like they know they're early and they know all the shit that comes with like early technology and and as far as i can tell from like subreddits and like discord channels um, yeah but this is the second target group the target no, group no, no, no 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 ready no, I, to play I, around with cables I I have been also observing the reddit sub uh, the subreddit um for the Oculus uh, quest i mean people were so much discussing different casings and different modifications. Like, I mean, frankly, it seems like people were really trying to figure out what's the maximum possible thing. I mean, just imagine you're somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it's it's a village or or a city, and no one heard of VR. You ordered a quest because you saw it on you know Facebook advertisement, and you are suddenly really cool. And then you start to dig into it. Okay, what can I do more? Okay, I can side load things. That's people figure out pretty quickly. Oh, I can use my desktop. Uh, I think if you dig slightly into it, like also re- if you just read any forums or talk with people who use it, you might come across 
trust the ability to you know stream or use a quest link don't think facebook slash oculus are advertising it so much but i would expect most most yeah. users actually you know considering it we, we are okay we are by the way talking out of our ass we don't have yeah. numbers about this but like but from the analytics. overall <laughs> but <laughs> of the overall sentiment is that at least vr headsets have way more way more people that are like technically savvy enough to try you know non-easy things if the payoff is worth it and and the payoff is is seeming pretty obvious from like what you see on on reddit and what you see on yeah. uh, on twitter it's like the, with especially with quest link or alvr streaming or you know just pc pc vr streaming um there's a there's a lot of people that are or even side loading dude like look how many games like I, I really wonder what the percentage of quest users are that have gone to oculus website made an account signed up as a developer just to be able to side load apps onto their quest i'd say that's like a considerable amount of users and I, I wouldn't say it's a majority but like that's a lot of users that takes that's not a casual user that like is buying you know a nintendo switch that they just want to play you know zelda with yeah. and don't ever want to look into like you know what else you can do with it i think that, that like jailbreaking right yeah it's 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 a similar you can think of it in a similar way and and that will change you know that percentage of of people will Get, I guess get lower and lower as this yeah. medium is growing, but that's that's where we are today. And so I guess you shouldn't be too afraid of something being not that easy or streamlined because if you have good enough documentation, like if there's good tutorials on YouTube, dude, any user that has zero understanding of anything can follow a dumb like tutorial on YouTube and get to what they yep. want if the payoff is worth it. Like and if there's anything I've learned from that, like I've learned so much stuff from YouTube being a dumb user myself, like um, just by following step-by-step -step guides. And you can't break so much. That's the whole point. Like, uh, I mean, the worst thing can happen. You can't install the side quest or you can't really side load apps because you have the wrong cable, but you can't really rig the headset itself i mean i did some extensive site loading with it and tried a lot of stuff it still works and yeah it's very solid no and driver actually, issues either yeah. you know like to no steam vr issues well, no driver, windows issues the quest link is a little buggy okay that, that's better. true but um yeah but you know by the way i didn't buy a hundred dollar or hundred euro <laughs> i don't cable. think many people will i uh I just used my, I have a little SSD, a, US, a USB-C to USB-A mm -hmm. SSD, and then I, it's like a tiny cable, and I plug that into a USB 3.0 extension cable. It's like super long. It's like nine, it's like three meters or nine meters or something. What? And it works? Yeah, it works. It works really well. And uh, I'm like, I don't know why people are buying like a very expensive cable if, uh, if any, like 3.0 or 3.1 USB-C cables work. It's actually quite interesting how Oculus in the end decided to do it. I mean, they kind of compressed the video and it's being decompressed on the Quest. Dude, it's a hack. It's like such yeah. an afterthought for them. It really came... I, I doubt they were thinking about this before launch. Yeah, I, I really, really imagine. think so. And like, it's such a sick selling point. For 400 bucks, you get a yeah. PC VR headset and you get an all-in-one headset. Like there's... Dude, I don't know what... Like there's no way you would recommend anything else. Like the next step, of course, is a Valve Index, but that's only if you have enough money to get that. And Yeah, and you have to be like really enthusiastic. I, I mean, look, um, you mentioned before those, you know, billions of dollars uh, that... Facebook spent on, uh, you know, Oculus and stuff. I mean, I've, I read through the research blog uh, and I kind of occasionally go to it and they definitely do really cutting edge KI or AI paper stuff. Mm -hmm. And even how the whole basic tracking system of the Quest is designed around, like it does simultaneously 30 times per second or whatever on this mobile chip slam. So it kind of structures the world around you roughly. It kind of does IMU sensor fusion. So it kind of is figuring out where you are in space, not just visually, but also from the accelerometers and uh, gyroscopes, uh, gyroscopes. And it also is doing some prediction and that is all running yeah on, on, this on, mobile on a mobile device. on a mobile device yeah yeah it's crazy. and then dude not only that but now hand tracking fucking yeah hand tracking yeah <laughs> on top of that like that's that's pretty decent i mean i have a theory that it might be sooner or later um going to i mean it, it might be sooner going to exist in more headsets simply because qualcomm released their new 855 865 or some x2 chip or whatever they call it oh it the xr2 yeah xr2 it has like hand tracking eye tracking and i think even six degrees of freedom tracking inside the chip 
So if Qualcomm, you know, spent all the research money and it's solid, maybe it will fix the next headsets, not only from uh, Oculus itself, because I'm actually worried. I mean, for 400 bucks, getting a standalone headset plus a desktop headset, plus you kind of have, you know, good apps that's kind of well curated, plus you can sideload, plus, you know, apparently, I mean, people probably do still porn with VR, right? And I guess it's still a, a big fraction of it. What, what are you What are you worried about? Like, I, I'm, I didn't I'm, I'm, I'm kind of worried that, you know, it's hard to do a competitor, like competition for them, right? It's hard to b develop a competitive headset to the Quest right now. You know, it's not even a hard... Like, so you're right. The competition it's is expensive. this thing. But it's honestly, it's not even a matter of hardware because... The hard, there, there are other hard, there is other hardware similar to the Quest, even if they're not like, let's say it's like 80% of the way there or 90% of the way. The, the reason why Quest is like, a, like a monopoly in its, in its categories is because the, it's attracted enough developers and games and just applications for it. And it's, it's its own hardware. It's its own, you know, ecosystem and app store. Um, so when the Vive Focus comes out or and it has come out, you know, like what, what do you, if you buy that as a user, what, what do you do with it? Like, what do you, what do you play with it? There's like, I guess there's, I have, I don't know. I haven't looked into Vive yeah. port, but. Well, didn't um, the Vive already officially refocus only on the business customers? There was the an Focus. interview uh, with the hmm. new CEO and. He said that their official new strategy is um, focusing only on the enterprise or at least business customers. Okay. I mean, yeah. what else is there for them to do? I mean, they kind of... Yeah, they I mean, put they themselves in a corner. Yeah. yeah, especially on the consumer side. Like, I mean, I just read the Road to VR article about, uh, you know, the amount of of SKUs they have like the different amount of uh different Vive packages you can buy. Yeah. There's like nine of them. And I was like, I didn't even know that there was more than like two or three. And they just canceled the Vive Pro and the Vive Pro. Well, they didn't something. cancel it. They all, all they said is that now they sell only the one with the eye tracking. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's like consolidated. And then even within that, there's like a few different packages. And then there's the So Vive. I mean this is this is nothing surprising. They only had a number of different models that did the same and now they are having yeah. just one. So For sure, for sure. That that that, that makes sense. It's just 5G um, will change it. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The that most elusive <laughs> most elusive yeah. uh, new technology right right at the horizon. Um, yeah, a fun small conspiracy theory. Uh, from what I understand, the only reason that we hear so much about 5G is that the carriers actually want to compete with Amazon and all the cloud storage providers and cloud computing providers. And they think if they have like a quick enough router slash 5G thing next to you, they can put also some servers next to it and then they can say, oh, we stream a few milliseconds shorter because our backbone to Amazon is super tiny, but we have the servers already here. So I think that's the only reason we see so much 5G. It has nothing to do with us consumers actually in the end or even pro users. It's not even a clear benefit for like phones. Like phones right now, if they're running on 5G, it's like such a battery drain. So yeah. it needs even a few more years. Like I'm sure that'll go away, right? In a few generations or even in one generation, like they'll just find a better way of like handling uh, like high bandwidth like um, connections. But like right, right now, 5G completely drains phones' batteries, which is why the 5G phones that are out in like 2019, 2020, um, have huge batteries. Yeah, huge batteries. Yeah. And, uh, well, yeah. I mean, there is a reason why Steve Jobs back then, apparently, that's what I, you know, read here and there, wanted the iPhone uh, to run on Wi Fi, right? I mean, they apparently were thinking about ditching cellular network. And in a sense, you have right now 5G, which is going to be rolled out, which is almost Wi Fi like from, I mean, it has a little bit of bigger range, right? But it's still kind of 4G underlying. I have been like, reading through some articles about this whole 5G bubble, and I just don't understand how you will be able to have like 20 or 30 times more of the cellular towers because the range is just shorter. So this is basically Wi-Fi routers we will put in every house, but they are then 5G, okay? But this is also not happening, so I don't know. And the answer is blockchain. <laughs> or am I too late? <sighs> yeah, yeah, you missed, you missed the train on that one. <laughs> oh, man. The answer is Libra. The Facebook best crypto. The best like memory of blockchain or like, yeah, the best thing about it from the last four years is all the uh, people that would show up to VR events in 20, 
early 20 like in 2016 and early 2017 to see them all of all of a sudden jump the ship into blockchain in 2017 um you know just because like suddenly blockchain and cryptocurrency like or the the price their prices started surging and everyone's like oh now this is the coolest thing for me to do (laughs) and it's like okay like clearly you weren't in this for like you know i don't want to say for the right reasons but like you just you, you were in you were interested in vr because it was the new thing on the market other than like yeah you didn't see through the veil understand it like and any sort of deep level of why this is like valuable for people for users for humanity Mm -hmm. and uh and like i i mean i there's a few people that come to mind that i just like saw suddenly like them going into like wanting to be a vr entrepreneur into being a blockchain we had an episode on blockchain Remember? We had one, yeah. One. And it was with uh, uh, Otoy. So Otoy, Otoy is yeah. the uh, company that makes Octane Render, and they have a, a cloud kind of rendering system for you know artists or filmmakers to send their rendering jobs to be processed in the cloud. But instead of it being processed in a farm, you could like process it on people's machines um as far as i know it's launched i haven't seen it or don't know anyone that's like used it as uh, i don't know it's called the render token um the episode is named like render token the only cryptocurrency that makes sense or something along those lines probably um, not yeah maybe not i i, I don't know I'm, <laughs> I'm not great at titling these things apparently but um i still think i mean that was an interesting you know, probably one of the better use cases of using a GPU to, you know, for a proof of work type of token. I got all the crypto people that are listening are like, "Ah, he's not sharing it right. Um, But like, if you're going to be, you know, yeah, it's a ledger. It's an open ledger. ledger. If if you're going to be, you know, processing something on a GPU, just, you know, random math, then it's better. It's better, I guess, if it's being used to render, you know, pixels for a film rather than just math to prove out that, you know, you're on the the right, like you're in the blockchain correctly. Mm, You know, when we look back in the 99 episodes, right? I mean, a lot of things has happened in our lives with technology. We have now some things that we dreamed about, like the quest, but, um, I mean, not every company we interviewed, right? And not every guest we had on a podcast did actually, you know, had a successful uh, career with a product or the service. Sure. Um, I mean, we had, uh, you know, we talked about Magic Leap and I think they are struggling. But then we had uh, companies like Control Labs, Leap uh, Motion and Beat Saber. You know, I think O3 got acquired and we had Meta who actually shut down physically. So what do you think, uh, guys, uh, what, what's like the spirit? Do, did, did we actually catch the really outstanding things with a podcast? Did we miss something down the line or was it like... Are we like Simpsons slice? and predicting the future? Yeah. No, we have a, uh, with a hundred episodes, we have a normally distributed <laughs> uh, set of, you know, successes Fails and failures <laughs> and, uh, you know, you'll have a few outliers, which we, I guess we actually do have a, a considerable amount, you know, of, of companies that we've talked to, but I mean, I don't know, we you can't just say that we're good at predicting who's succeeding and who, who's not. We all, there's also the bias of like the people, the, the companies that have been on the podcast or the people that have been you know, they were already succeeding to a certain extent, you know, and so that put us on, that put them on our radar and this and that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, people that are listening, I'm sure quite a lot of them have maybe changed jobs over the course of four years, you know, moved on to something else, moved into a different VR company or moved to an entire different industry. Um, yeah, I mean, that most, unfortunately most startups fail that's that's like the reality of it you know some of them uh stick around some of them get acquired some of them become really big successes but most of them are especially if it's a startup like that original idea is doesn't really pan out and that's that's not particularly a bad thing like that's that's the reason why you can make like the idea of like failing fast like you 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 have to iterate on ideas um before you can get to something that like actually has real legs that can grow um it doesn't mean that the whole company needs to fail quickly but like to even if it's a idea that you build a company on that you have to iterate on it and see if that was originally the right plan like 
just to, again, talk about my company or not my company, but the company I work at, Realities.io started with the Realities um, app on Steam, which is still free and it's there, but it's it was a virtual tourism app. That was the original idea for Realities is to have a platform for people to, for us to first make photogrammetry experiences, like non-linear stories and films for people to experience. And then for that to grow for other users to be able to make that those types of experiences on the app. Um, but that's not what we're doing these days. Like that, first of all, like our photogrammetry uh, experiences take so long to build. Um, and we, I guess we have like f- quite a few now, five or six different ones in the app itself. Um, that took way longer than expected. And then photogrammetry itself also is like not easy. So there aren't that many people that are doing it enough that you would have like a, an ec- ecosystem. So you have to kind of try an idea, iterate, and then fail, or at least kind of like tweak it and change it. And where we found to be, you know, the most um, like valuable thing we could be doing is to work with, uh, like work on projects, work, work on contract and like get paid to do that and not need to like keep raising and raising and raising, you know, and have to like, you know, be unprofitable. So that's mm. kind of where realities has been. Like we've, we've done a lot of, um, like B2B contract work. Um, we have built like a few different experiences, some of them that haven't launched yet, but, um, we are, yeah. Anyway, we, I, I can't talk about too much yet. But we haven't mm-hmm. like announced stuff, stuff, but, um, <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's the reality is like, you kind of have to survive and you kind of have to, it's like evolution. I mean, you have to kind of just try and like, <laughs> you know, for the evolution, there's just the iteration of, and adapt. Uh, yeah, so you like need the, to live and adapt whenever you need to. Yeah. And you kind of have to match the environment that you're in. So, sure. okay. yeah, definitely. Um, I have a different question for you. In this big philosophical spirit, still, what is the thing about virtual reality, since we all still work mostly in virtual reality, um, that keeps you up at night, that doesn't make you sleep, that doesn't let you sleep? Mm, for me, honestly, it's. Uh... The promise that I see uh, with virtual reality, augmented reality, no matter what you call it, like things around you that you can interact with, combined with the recent developments of AI. So I don't think we are quite there yet, but um, in maybe two, maybe five, maybe 10 years, I can pretty much imagine uh, you know, a situation where the device on your head, no matter what it is, can almost guess what you're about to do. And it can make the whole experience feel more seamless and more intuitive. And that way, hopefully, that's at least my big hope, provide you a way to explore data, concepts, and knowledge in a fundamentally different way. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it will be amazing and will substitute everything else. Some people still prefer paper, some people prefer touchscreens. You know, it's, it's, it's not about substituting it. But I kind of see this medium being able to you know, democratize knowledge in a way which it hasn't yet done so far. And I think one of the reasons is basically that uh, you kind of have to bootstrap, like similar to what others just described, a lot of companies just can't go full scale unless you're Facebook, and Facebook is just too focused on gaming, and not really on this productive or educational side. And it's kind of a moonshot, because you also need really big advancements in AI and uh, artificial intelligence for that to work. So... I would say, I mean, you basically ask what keeps me at night uh, awake, right? I mean, kind of the dream to swim through data and be, you know, <laughs> inside uh, the matrix. I, I, I don't know, just, just somehow merge with the but internet. Wait, the, isn't the question more uh, from from Christoph that it's um, what are like, like what keeps you up at night? As in, like, what 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 do you see? What, what's bothering you about actually both? VR so I didn't want you to hmm. add it directly in the question. But I would like to hear both, like, at least one good thing and one bad thing. So hmm. let's just mention what excites him right. about virtual reality to the point where he can sleep. And so it would be interesting to see what stresses, his, uh, stresses him out. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what worries you the most about yeah. VR and AR? Yeah, the glass Later. ceiling in Europe, obviously. I mean, we talked <laughs> multiple times about the glass ceiling. And, uh, I mean, 
I mean, we are in a we are one hour in the podcast or whatever, so probably only the hardcore fans listen. There is some things that I can't announce yet, but um, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of going this freelance route because um, and also you know the, the bigger project which will uh, soon come out. So follow me on Twitter. Um, it it kind of aims at fi fixing at least a little bit um, some issues with this glass ceiling. And with a glass ceiling, I mean you have enormous potential. In Europe, in Germany, in Osterbrück, it doesn't matter. You have always everywhere local champions, as you used to call them here in the local politics, like some enormous amount of very focused competence, whether it's agriculture, whether it's some health tech uh, companies, and they exist since 100 years, since 200 years, whatever. Like there is this great amount of potential and it's just not being used because you have hesitation on the one hand, from corporates, which in Germany we usually call Mittelstand, uh, right? So, uh, like those companies which just float and exist. Middle-sized uh, companies. Middle-sized companies. They are afraid of trying new things out, at least in Germany. The big corporates, of course, act global-wide and they don't care so much about local markets. And then you have basically just the market for B2B relations with VR, IR, whatever technology you have. And there's just no room for big, great experiments. You know, like a new social app in VR or whatever. I mean, we had uh, where thoughts go on research VR uh, at some point. It was quite an interesting episode. Um, and I don't see things like that happening. And I don't see them happening, especially in Europe. So I'm kind of a little bit worried that it's not just VR, but you see yeah. it especially with VR because I'm actually, uh, you know, qu quite aware of the, of the changes there as you are. Yeah. Maybe that, that's described. You, as that you're in Berlin. I yeah. heard a lot of good things about Berlin, as in like Berlin is a new San Francisco and that sort of uh, uh -huh. things. Do you have a do you do you agree with it? Oh, I mean, you can find articles about every city that's like is yeah. X the new Silicon Valley? Yeah, of, no, no, I don't mean articles. I actually met people who uh, work in Berlin. <laughs> no, Ber Berlin is great. I mean, Berlin actually has uh, a lot of very interesting uh, people and companies. Uh, the reason, actually, I really like Berlin coming from San Francisco is because it has a much more creative focus and it's just much more likely you run into like artists and musicians, which you kind of okay. don't in San Francisco. And it's like when you have conversations with people, it's like, oh yes, which tech company do you work in and what sort of engineering do you do? And uh, here it's like, okay, first of all, who are you? <laughs> Where do you come from? Like, what country do you come from? What languages do you speak? And then like, if you do end up talking about work, like what sort of things do you work on? And it's like very often not tech related, which is great. I see. Um, it's interesting. But going back to glass ceiling or just to comment on that. Um, yeah, I, I like even before coming to Germany, like I, and looking at our stats and our, and our listen, listening rates, like Germany has been consistently the second biggest country mm -hmm. where we have, uh, listeners from first is us, second is Germany, uh, and then the UK. Um, I also, also didn't realize how big Germany was when it comes to population. Mm -hmm. Is it, what is it? 80 million? 80, 100? 80 million. 86, I think. It's quite a lot. Um, but even within that, like there's, there's a lot of like, talent there's a lot of engineering yes. um and there's also a lot of consumers just a lot of like people that are like hardcore enthusiasts and gamers um so that's cool so germans that are listening uh hello <laughs> um uh, hello we <laughs> get uh, um but uh yeah i think what's the difference is like maybe like there, there are a lot of companies in Germany that exist, maybe these middle-sized companies, like they exist around feeding the other larger companies. Um, and like we, we, even us, like at realities, we did a project for Audi. Um, and that was literally like a year long endeavor, like last year. Um, mm -hmm. and there's entire towns that are built with their economies built around like the yes. car companies. And so, sure. you know, the German economy, as far as I know, which is very little, um, there's a lot of like, you know, in interworking companies that do things. So suppliers, maybe, yeah. maybe, yeah, suppliers, basically, it's a good, good way to put it. Um, so I guess in, in like SF and Silicon Valley, like there's just the thinking, the thinking is a little bit different and like how the, how this engineering gets applied is just always on a very broad scale. Like they always shoot for the mood. They always shoot for, you know, they want to be a very large and very fast scaling company because with software, like 
it's just so much cheaper to be able to like make a large mm-hmm. impact. You don't have to like have factories building stuff. You don't have to have that crazy of a, I guess, supply chain if you can just push code and it's, uh, it can be on people's devices instantly. Um, so that there is a difference in thinking in that, in that regard. Uh, people go to SF and Silicon Valley to learn, you know, how, how to do this. And, and it's, it's very imp- inspiring, honestly, to be around people that are thinking like that. Like it's, I'm, I'm thankful that I was there and I did learn a lot. I met quite a lot of people, um, interesting people. And, but the, the best part about all of this is that all of those learnings and all that knowledge is on the internet. And in fact, you don't have to be there to learn. Like I, even though I was in SF when I was doing, uh, like before realities IO and I was like also freelancing and, you know, doing my own production company, like I spent so much time like listening to lectures, um, and reading just like stuff from that came out of Y Combinator stuff that, um, the people running that accelerator like wrote about, um, I felt like I learned, like I almost learned like a, a small MBA, you know, like how, mm-hmm. like at least like a startup, startup MBA, like how does, how do you have to think, uh, about strategically like being like, okay, you can code, you can build something great. How, what, what should you build? And then compared to like giants, how should you do that? How should you position yourself? So that, that sort of stuff is like, much more about strategy and that the best part about it is you really don't have to be anywhere for that. Like, I guess as long as you can, you, you spend the time to learn and think about it, like that really does apply. And, um, I mean, what, you what do you good point with? us, um, but I mean, um, one of the business ideas that I'm toying around is actually helping out startups with, you know, finding corporate clients and VCs and connecting basically in innovation, right? I mean, it's, it's fancy words. Forget the fancy words. The whole thing is I'm really shocked. You know, I, I've been through a lot of, uh, you know, events in the last few months and just exploring and looking again at the startup scene in Germany. I, of course, was always a little bit more biased towards VR, and I've been just trying to look a little bit outside the bubble that we have been you know, swimming in. And I mean, first of all, people don't really know what to search for. So, I mean, I've been uh, lucky enough to be with Chris in San Francisco. We met and I, I also learned a lot of fair shares there. And through mm-hmm. those international VR bubble, of course, I, I also ended up watching stuff about VCs and how to build your marketing stuff on YouTube, which is amazing, especially from Y Combinator. But people don't watch it in English here. At least I have mm-hmm. met so many people who kind of watch more the German ripoff. Yesterday, I've been listening to one of those uh, official media podcast from from sort of the state me i think target show disrupt or whatever hmm. and i was like yeah there was like this copycat ex-investor who is now investing in more traditional b2b business and i mean the words that you were saying were making sense but kind of lacks this drive so i mean you could learn all hmm. the stuff on youtube sure but you but still you have to need speak capital english, yeah I mean, you still you need to speak English. You need yeah. to know that you should watch it rather than English. You need to open up your mind towards, okay, fail fast. It's a very strange concept in Germany, yeah. even yeah. in Europe. Yeah. Uh, and you need capital. And it's not that easy to raise money if, first of all, there is not such a big VC market uh, in Europe in general compared to San Francisco, right? And then mm-hmm. the stories that I ended up hearing from startups, I mean, they go to people who claim they are VCs or they want to invest, but they are more from this traditional mid-sized companies. So they evaluate mm-hmm. on completely different tracks. So you basically want to do something which you got maybe even inspired from the spirit from San Francisco, right? But you end up still pivoting towards a more classical B2B company, which is not inherently bad because it might be way more sustainable than actually doing this turbo capitalism with WeWork examples, right? SF, right? But still, um, you kind of like the people who just come to you and say, okay, you can do it. Just try it out. Nothing bad will happen. Because if you fail, at least in the German society with your company, it's kind of really bad. And everyone is like, ooh, you failed your company. I don't think this is the spirit in SF, right? I mean, that's it's a learned thing for sure. I mean, in the US, it's not, even though, yes, there's this cowboy mentality of like, you know, try and, and always shoot for the moon. And, you know, you can, you can, like, it's, it's about, the whole American dream is like built around that, but like it is very unique, especially to like California and Silicon Valley, at least to me that it was new to me also when I moved there that like the idea of failing, not being a bad thing was, was very novel. It took me, um, it took me like failing a class in college to even (laughs) to like understand that and to like be like, okay, I shouldn't 
think I'm the worst and the, the worst like person in the world, like the worst student in the world, um, to, that if I do fail on something, but but you're right. I mean, that this is a very specific mentality that kind of is, is learned and, and, and ingrained. And, um, I think that, that it's not just the idea of like being okay with like doing something large scale and then failing and then not being embarrassed by that, but it's like setting it up where you're like, rather than building an isolation, which is what I've seen companies do. Like, you know, yeah. we're going to spend 12 months, 18 months building a product. Maybe we'll try, try it out with, you know, test it out with a few users here and there. We know we'll yeah. try this, but like building an isolation is like such a, you, you're so prone to go down like a wrong track with yes. no users there instead of like publicly building something and from the very early days like publicly iterating posting what you're doing on twitter and then seeing what the engagement is and as that engagement grows it or like as it doesn't grow you also will it'll be like okay well maybe there isn't so much of an interest in here or like maybe i need to start learning how to like better understand how to market this um this is something yeah. that like i do see as like fundamentally like i, I see Silicon Valley based, um, like companies doing this a little bit better than, uh, than, than other companies. Two um, short thoughts on that. I think yeah. first is, uh, at least that's what I observed and I still think how it's true. You kind of almost learn to pitch better and to be better at yeah. presenting and speaking. You have to pitch all yeah. the time. Like it's like not, not to like get money, but like every time someone asks you, like yeah. you know, your friend asks you, like, well, okay, what are you working on? It just puts you in the position where you're like, okay, I have to understand who this person is and what mm -hmm. sort of like what, like what sort of understanding of whatever technology do they have, and and around that you just have to like be able to f uh, shift what your what your what you have to explain to them. So like, I'll give myself as an example. Someone asked me like, what what is your job? What is photogrammetry? I'm like, okay, like I I never assume that anyone knows this because most like people don't know this. So you kind of have to like take a 10,000 step view be like um so my job involves like using for virtual reality like have you have you heard of that this kind of like thing you put on your head mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah I, i've seen some people use it like okay cool um uh, i my job involves um basically 3d scanning like places so 3d scanning where um i don't even use photogrammetry i don't even dis explain cameras like i don't go into the technology i just explain that we 3d scan a room. So like this room, and, and I always point to like the room that we're standing in, like we scan this, uh, entirely. And then, uh, in VR, like there's different application. Well, actually I'm not doing a really good job pitching this, but like, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I explained that like, yes, on the B2B side, like there's, there's a lot of interesting applications that come out of like oh. being able to like take a place in real life, uh, 3d scan it and then have a digital, you know, a digital twin version of it. Um, and then I, I, I can exp like, and then I give them examples of the projects that we've done with them and like what, you know, what use cases that have served. I mean, we don't have, I mean, if I'm, there's other things that I can talk about in terms of like the, uh, like the pipeline that we've built and like where that fits in and why that's valuable. But like, first sure, you're, you're right. The pitching is like such a, learned mm -hmm. skill that you have to like just try over and over again and you and you're not good at it from the start and sure you know, like you heard me botching it in this in this episode but like it's something that like you ha you just have to be able to yes twist to to the person that you're talking to um every time and now imagine you don't have necessarily the developed skill for pitching you don't necessarily have the environment where you're forced to you're right. kind of operating behind the scenes and Right. Most of your clients tend to be B2B right. with a rolling of new technology six to 12 months. Let's say you built an awesome product. You kind of need to convince, uh, you need to convince your investors, at least in Germany, and I think it holds for Europe, that it's a viable product. You need to somehow integrate it somewhere and show it. And that takes six to 12 to 18 months because you have slow processes in those companies because they themselves are kind of not ready to accept innovation. I mean, uh, yeah, but there is a, there is a, a nuance about this specific argument about 12, 18 months to roll out technology. Once you do it, the technology doesn't exit the company. The, it's very hard to remove this technology. So once you get it done once, you have a lot of stable customers for whom the only way is to 
expand how much they use this technology. That's the old model of, let's say, something like, not Salesforce, but uh, what's this German company uh, called doing this huge CRM? SAP. SAP, yeah. So a lot of companies went bankrupt by implementing SAP. And um, I mean, you have basically different high level stakes on, on what SAP actually provides. Some think when you want your company to be merged or acquired, you, you, you know, integrate SAP so you can actually address processes in different companies. But of course, if you have like a system you implement at every desk on every person and it changed completely the whole process, how you, you, you know, do inventorization or whatever, you can't get that out. But uh, let's be honest, technology is changing very quickly. It's consumer behavior changes, shared economy versus not shared economy, production methods change. You know, you actually need to produce less or more or quicker. The demand changes, but it's also how quickly can you actually iterate. And that definitely makes you slower on the one hand where you just are very, very sure about this technology that you really want to put in. But I would argue that if you don't have test grounds, if you don't actually have innovation departments that work explicitly with external partners and don't try to do it in-house with those fancy innovation offices, which just basically grinds through the walls of the corporate that they are in, inside, and you actually allow for certain things to fail just on a periphery where it doesn't hurt your main business, you're probably better off in a global competition. It's just if you don't have one. these offices or if you do have them, if you have uh, an openness to external innovation, if I you see. work with startups, with uh, the government, with science, but also with VCs and just basically cooperate and see where can we actually join efforts. Let's take Osnabrück, for example, right? Osnabrück is a tiny city, 150,000 or whatever. But around Osnabrück, there is a huge amount of agricultural companies that are just basically market dominant in the world, like uh, building tractors and agriculture tech. And you would imagine the city is a perfect place for a hub. And there is a lot of chat about uh, that in the local politics, but it's just not happening because those companies are too hesitant. Of course, you don't have big VCs in Osnabrück, but Osnabrück surprisingly would be the really good case to open some kind of agriculture tech hub. But this is the thing, you have too many big companies distributed across huge amount of land and they are very slow to even, you know, try anything new before it's really solid. So how would you expect things to develop? I mean, on the one hand, you don't have early adopters and early customers. On the other hand, you don't have a huge VC market. And the government is also usually in the way with regulations, which technically makes sense, just not so much necessarily for young, innovative startups. So I, I think it's just a glass ceiling, which on the one hand, of course, you can watch those videos. And if you're lucky enough to be in San Francisco for a few months or you live there for a few years, it doesn't have to be San Francisco, of course. It can probably be also Shenzhen or Tel Aviv. It, it, I mean, it's, SF itself is not that special, I guess. I mean, it is, but you could probably get this entrepreneurship. I don't know what the word for it is somewhere else. But even if you have it and you come here, okay, what's, what, what can you do? Like, Of course, you can use the right word and pitch it rightly. And then you have probably a easier way to do your B2B bootstrapping business. But you still can't repeat the same thing as Magic Leap did. No one will give you one, two, three billion for a crazy idea here, which is maybe good. But also there is not so much capital for round A or B for any, you know, mid-sized, normal, innovative startups here. So you kind of end up small. I think you said a good point where, especially with like you're saying the ag tech companies in Osnabrück are they're large, large and old companies and they're yeah. not really... That hasn't really changed with any new companies. That that is a big difference in the in the U.S. Where like the if you look at uh, the Forbes like top five hundred companies, the Forbes five hundred, I guess, mm -hmm. um, there's actually quite a lot of change that has happened in the last twenty years, much more than you would see in uh, in Europe, especially yes. when it comes to like wealth. So it, like, there's just that idea of like new and small companies being able to come and disrupt something and, and, and to go up, um, to like, to, you know, d disrupt an entire industry from, um, God, I almost don't want to use the word disrupt anymore. It's like such a, <laughs> it's like become like a bad evolve. thing word to use, but like it, it, it is that idea. Yeah. Of like a new, a new incumbent kind of like entering a, a market and to be able to like make a lot of changes like that, I guess is not as common of a thing in Europe. I like how we completely have like ignored the yeah. list of topics that we <laughs> wanted to talk about in this episode and have Research, like Research, food, games. Well, yeah, we haven't yeah. talked for months now, so we have to, yeah. you know, there's a lot to catch on. Yeah. That for we sure. had over time. 
Uh I think this is a good um, area to kind of uh, end things and to also perhaps plug uh, what we think about, like, if, if you're into these sort of discussions, we're actually thinking about creating a new Patreon page um, that will be just kind of like the two of us, the three of us talking um, much more kind of like meta, uh, like conversations about perhaps the industry, about ourselves, about like even episodes, um, and then keep the main Research VR podcast channel, like the one that you're on and the one you're listening to, to specifically like interviews with, uh, with like different founders, designers, and like basically like external interviews with people um so if you want to hear more yeah discussion based stuff like this uh definitely consider subscribing to our patreon we're gonna have this uh everything linked in the description we haven't launched it yet we have so the reason i'm saying it's a new patreon is because we did have a patreon before um but over the last i guess it was like six to seven months ago or maybe even eight months ago, I shot, I actually uh, unlaunched the page because first of all, we had a very low output in 2019, specifically because like both Peter and I were like really busy. I had to like move to Germany and like I was doing a full-time job and that was taking a lot of my time. Um, and so I felt bad for having like a monthly Patreon running without many episodes coming out. So I think the new Patreon will actually be, first of all, episode based. So you won't pay anything until we, you won't pay anything until a new episode comes out. So you'll basically be paying per episode. And on top of that, there there will most likely also be these sort of discussions that will be only for Patreon listeners. Um, Whether or not these will be live or not, like as in live streamed, I don't know. Maybe that will come in the future. But um, I I do, we do like having these discussions for sure. And it just Hmm. like the format that the podcast got into was much more about interview based kind of, um, bringing people on not for us to talk but for them to like really share their learnings and Um, by the way you developed remarkable skills for interviewing people thanks man i I have to say like the podcast is uh i mean it started kind of with us three toying around and (laughs) stuff but to be honest i kind of really enjoy how it you know developed and I mean, we mentioned before we had some cool guests. Yeah, we had some really cool acquisitions following after. Sure. Now we interviewed someone. It's mostly, you know, due to Azad, right? I mean, he has just a very good nose for those very interesting topics. And you're really good at lurking out, you know, and getting out the juicy stuff from people in a very, very <laughs> humble and, I don't know, just very polite way. So. No, I appreciate that. I do spend a lot of time, like, especially over the, like, in 2019, I did really take serious the the uh, interviews that I was doing and, like, Rather than, yeah, you were right. When we first started this, it was like, oh, let's just do this Joe Rogan style. Yeah, like just jump into it, get high, like just talk. Like (laughs) it'll be fun. It'll be fun for everyone. Uh, That's what everyone thinks. And it's like, no, that's actually not very fun. Um, And I actually took inspiration from um, Lex Friedman, this uh, kind of physics AI uh, podcaster who he like his podcast. Dude, he has the most high level like guests, like from, from physics and artificial intelligence, like, like from a very academic perspective, um, like basically the, all the authors that like, I love to read and he has the most like structured, like incredible, like interview style where he just has like really good questions written out and he just really sticks to them. Um, and I realized I was like, what am I doing? Like, I should really prepare for these. Like, I mean, I did prepare decently for like, I, I know that you were usually like, the best prepared yet. Uh, yeah, I mean, if uh, typically like the guests that came on was because like either I had a personal rela- relationship with them at some point or had like been introduced to them. Um, there's been like one or two times where a PR person from their team has reached uh-huh. out to us and then th- and stayed in the conversation and stayed. Yeah. And the background, oh like gosh. listening to the interview is the worst. We don't do that L- anymore. Luckily, we didn't release it and we won't even name the company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's been a few we haven't released cause, just because like. Yeah, they didn't meet. Uh, Bullshit certain. meter did uh, spike a little too much, despite blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I I do like to like really like uh, have very like very specific questions that I want to ask uh, ask these people, and um, and and I think they have a you know they enjoy it as well rather than the same usual bullshit of like okay, so how are you here, and then what are you doing? What does your company do? It's like 
if if especially if someone's been interviewed before and there's other podcasts like and, and i love to ra- reference you know like if they've been interviewed on like uh voices of vr like you know i typically like even reference their answers in from that podcast so rather than being the same question it's like okay now this is the part two of that question you know like i i like to build I mean, on top us, of that. just to plug two episodes that were like really remarkable 98 which is with sketch fabs uh mm. What is he? CEO? Uh, yeah. Yeah, he's a CEO. Album. Album. And uh, the one before was also like super deep with Avi Barzif. Oh, that was, yeah. It's, that. it's like I was enjoying the edit so much because it was just, yeah, I'm going to listen to it anyway. And um, just encouraging the audience, you know, if you haven't listened to it as the old archives, maybe you should, but the new ones are really good. Yeah, just skip the, the first like 20, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> skip the first 20 episodes. <laughs> and you know, you know there are people who actually start listening to the podcast from the beginning. I was actually recommending oh, Research VR to a few people. They were like, yeah, I'm going to listen to episode number one. And I'm like, oh, oh please no. <laughs> It no. has begun. <laughs> so says Christoph. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I love it. it. It's such a good, it's, it's, it's a, it was like such a serious tone too. It's like perfect. <laughs> um, but yeah. One short question. Uh, yeah. Before we maybe slowly wrap it up or don't, um, we had a quite interesting pattern in, you know, through the 99 episodes. On the one hand, we had, of course, techni, uh, like tech-based uh, topics, right? But we mm-hmm. had also always this um, thread, thread of uh, social VR, mm-hmm. like being something that will change VR, but also something that is maybe dangerous or has certain ethical concerns um what's the feeling of you guys like um is it still like a huge issue in social vr with harassment and other things have companies figured out a way around it or is it you know just people accepted it like with the internet i mean you know you have it's the full spectrum of human uh communication right (laughs) like (laughs) is twitter a good thing or a bad thing you know like the, it's 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 the same sort of morally ambiguous bubble. thing yeah it depends on like how you use it who you talk to and how you engage and uh i guess it will come back in a full strength with uh, facebook horizon or however this uh, social application for <laughs> facebook is called oh, yeah, it has again really I quite mean, about the uh, social vr until now was really for true fans or for people who just wanted to click quickly try it or they tried it with friends so if they uh, crossed some social boundaries with friends in virtual reality that was for uh, fun and giggles so that wasn't a problem Hmm. Uh, but now that the facebook horizon will be there for all the quest users Hmm. that might come back small anecdote (laughs) um so uh, a small show, uh, shout, shout out to Thomas Rost, uh, which is actually, you know, working on those ideas I've been plugging here and there through the podcast. Uh, we have, we meet regularly in VR, but not so much to discuss business, but actually to, you know, keep up with each other. We play a lot of multiplayer games and it was super strange. We haven't seen each other for two or three months, uh, but we were always like in VR playing like, uh, Serenity or, uh, uh, Arizona Sunshine and when we met it was like almost as if we you know seen each other physically it was kind of similar to the feeling I had where we have been always in big screen and at some point I saw Azad in Berlin I'm like okay I kind of I kind of saw him in VR mm-hmm. I kind of can relate to him I kind of remember his postures so I, I, I think VR is great uh, in the social realm to stay really close to friends you otherwise wouldn't see so often but there is not that much of a trend of really big scale gatherings, right? Like meta, meta like metaverse style. Yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, maybe that's for a reason. Like that's, I, I don't, I'm, I, I've been vocal about like that the metaverse isn't particularly like the most interesting thing to me and perhaps to everyone. Like I, I do, I still think hmm. like Instagram and Twitter, like those are, metaverses in, in in and of themselves and but you don't um, have to put a headset on and be in a specific room yeah. with a specific setup right it's um, kind of always with you like they're just a, a general thing of like yes humans will want to communicate with other humans like for different reasons like whether that's to play a game together or whether that's to to watch a film together and there will probably be different applications for each because of just the for uh 
focus, like for a set of developers to focus on making the, the film watching experience really good. Um, they don't need to focus as much on, you know, other aspects of social things. Like we have so many different ways of communication on, on like desktop and mobile, you know, doesn't all live in one app. Like, I don't think that's what you know, but honestly, there is this beauty of connecting in a party on a quest. The mic is really crisp, the audio is good, and just you know, slaughter zombies together or just do something. You yeah, just can't I'm, text each other. You have to use voice, you have to gesture. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think like an Xbox party system ah. sort of thing, like maybe that's like I, maybe I think that might even exist on Quest. I don't know, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you have yeah. this. Uh, buggy by the way uh, please someone at oculus fix this lovely buggy audio thing where you connect with a party together and then you can join games so it's, it's actually really strange on the go you used to have this official sdk where apps would actually use this avatar and all the things and you can almost join together in this virtual room and then join together in the games hmm. on the quest for some weird reason they don't have it maybe because of horizon you can only connect to a party and then you hear each other but you don't see each other before you join together a game uh, I always thought that it's strange that Facebook released a quest with so little social features on board, right? Yeah, who knows? I guess it's a lot matter of like prioritizing things. Corporate interests. Mm, no, just just no? like priorities of like, okay, let's make sure mm, everything but, else works. Mm, I don't but, know. But I mean, you want give game developers to earn money, right? And I mean, you see those games with multiplayer being sometimes, you know, 50% off, I guess, just lurk people into getting it and convincing their friends, you know, because if you have anything which is like uh, similar to Counter-Strike, where you have servers and the game is just not popular, people are just not going to stick around and wait yeah. for others to... Yeah, it's, it's a higher risk to make a multiplayer game than a single player game in VR currently, because yeah, you need more, more users for it to actually be effective well that's just like the room scale <laughs> you need something that you usually don't have which is the second person in case of multiplayer right huh. hmm. all right guys i'm uh yeah. my my tiredness level has reached its peak uh it's late for all of us uh thank you all for listening and uh thank you all for sticking around if you have been uh here from the beginning uh if you have, uh, drop us a line either at our email at uh, researchvrcast at gmail.com um, or on Twitter at researchvrcast. Um, you can also find, yeah, all three of us on Twitter. Yep. Um, but yeah, no, this has been, this has been amazing. Like, uh, like super happy that this is the industry that we've all found ourselves to be in. Um, even if that means we can, you know, we, we, diverge to go into other things um like which i have many times but like vr and ar is still fundamentally one of more the more interesting things so yes. thank you all for sticking around thank you christoph for um for popping in and uh, it was fun yeah this has been great having you and uh if you like this again consider supporting us on patreon so that uh you can hear more interesting meta discussions mm -hmm. and uh stick around we'll, we'll have more interesting podcasts just over the horizon Ooh. all right thank you 100 episode 100 whoop whoop, <laughs> whoop, whoop. bye bye, bye. <laughs>